Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Tonight's event brings a spotlight to the history of Black education within the United States by highlighting Dr. Carter G. Woodson, his important work, and legacy. As you know, PBS is dedicated to using media to educate, inspire, entertain, and express a diversity of perspectives. Today's important PBS Books event fulfills this crucial mission as we discuss fugitive pedagogy, Carter G. Woodson, and the art of Black teaching. We are thrilled to welcome all of you as we partner with the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, ASALA, which was founded by Carter G. Woodson in 1915. Having launched our partnership during Black History Month this year, we are thrilled to continue this important collaboration to ensure that important voices are heard. Today, I am honored to have ASALA's president, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham with us. Evelyn? Thank you. Hello, my name is Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham and I bring greetings from the association for the study of African American life and history, ASALA, as we call ourselves. We are excited about our partnership with PBS Books because it has brought about the opportunity to share conversations about new and fascinating publications on the Black experience. And I am especially excited this evening about the opportunity for, for talking about our founder, Carter G. Woodson. And Professor Jarvis Givens has been writing about Dr. Carter G. Woodson from a new perspective a new way for us to think about him as the father of black history. And what a special man he was, a man of great intellect and courage, who upon receiving his PhD in history from Harvard University in 1912, launched a movement to challenge the silences and refute the lies that were taught in universities and K through 12 schools throughout the United States silences and lies that fostered the racist idea that African-Americans had no history or none worthy of respect, and that they had done nothing worthy of equal citizenship. Woodson knew better. He believed that black people must fight for their rights through the power of pride from self-knowledge and the power of research and the dissemination of historical facts about people of African descent. And through Woodson's efforts to professionalize Black history, through research and through university courses and the publishing of books and articles, scholarship steadily filled in the gaps and corrected the fallacies and distortions. Through Woodson's efforts to popularize, not just professionalize, but popularize, bring Black history to the people. He gave us the annual celebration Negro History Week in 1926. Today we know it as Black History Month. And it took place especially in K through 12 segregated public schools. Until his death in 1950, Woodson worked tirelessly to make American history more inclusive and more representative as to the role of black people and their contributions to our nation's past and present. This history was taught and written not only by college professors, my own father, who was a junior high school history teacher, and later he became the principal of a public school in Washington, DC, worked with Carter Woodson on the Negro History Bulletin. My father's junior high school featured all kinds of activities during Negro History Week and emphasized black history all year long especially through what we call now the Black History Bulletin. In 2016, Congressman John Lewis spoke about Woodson and Asala and that reach into his boyhood segregated school in Troy, Alabama. He stated, when I was a little child growing up in rural Alabama, a short walk from the cotton fields, my teachers would tell us to cut out photographs of great African-Americans but Carter G. Woodson's Negro History Week, now called 
as I said, African hist Black History Month. So tonight, Jarvis Giv Givens tells a story about those teachers, those K through 12 public school teachers and the liberating role of history in the Black freedom struggle. Heather? Thank you, Evelyn. Your partnership and collaboration means so very much to PBS Books. So thank you so very much for being here this evening. Well, this evening, we'd like to thank our library network, numerous PBS stations, and Asala TV for sharing this conversation with all of you. And we'd like to thank you for joining us. Today's conversation has three featured guests. It is inspired by Professor Jarvis Givens, newly released book, Fugitive Pedagogy, Carter G. Woodson, and the Art of Black Teaching. Professor Givens is an assistant professor of education and African and African-American studies at Harvard University. His first book, the subject of tonight's conversation, was published in April by Harvard University Press. His research has been supported by the Ford Foundation, the Mellon W, the W, the, excuse me, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and the William F. Milton Fund. He has been published in peer reviewed journals such as American Education Research Journal, Souls, Harvard Educational Review, and Race, Ethnicity, and Education. He is also the co editor of We Dare Say Love, Supporting Achievement in the Educational Life of Black Boys. Professor Gibbons earned his PhD in African American Studies from the University of California, Berkeley. Welcome, Professor Gibbons. To converse about today's topic, we have Professor Cornell West. He is a philosopher, author, and activist. One of our nation's most esteemed scholars, Dr. West is a prominent and provocative democratic intellectual. He is the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Chair at Union Theological Seminary. He formerly taught at Yale, Harvard, and the University of Paris. Dr. Cornell West graduated magna cum laude from Harvard in three years and obtained his MA and PhD in philosophy at Princeton. He has written 20 books. He's edited 13. He's very busy. <laughs> Dr. West is also a frequent guest on the Bill Maha Mar Show, CNN, C-SPAN, and Democracy Now. He has produced three spoken word albums, recently won a Grammy. In short, Dr. West has a passion to communicate in order to keep alive the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., a legacy telling the truth and bearing witness to love and justice. Welcome, Dr. West. <laughs> and to guide the conversation this evening, we have Professor Brandon Terry. Brandon Terry is an assistant professor of African and African American studies and of social studies at Harvard University. He is the editor of 50 Years Since MLK and the co-editor with Tommy Shelby of To Shape a New World, The Political Philosophy of Martin Luther King Jr. Professor Terry has written for the New York Review of Books, the Boston Review, the LA Review of Books, The Point, Political Theory, Modern Intellectual History, and other journals and outlets. Welcome, Professor Terry. Thank you so much. Well, welcome and thank you for being here. So before I hand over the reins to the conversation, I just want to remind everyone out there, if you have a question, write it in the chat. There will be a Q&A section at the end of the conversation, and we want to ask your questions to the three guests. So please remember to do that. And without further ado, I'd like to hand over the reins to Professor Terry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather, and all the team at PBS Books, uh, and all the folks here from Asala, uh, and especially your president, my colleague and hero, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, for a wonderful introduction. Um, 
I just want to let you know, we'll discuss for about 30 minutes, 35 minutes, and then open it up to questions. We really want to hear from you all, so please don't be shy. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with uh, two of my favorite scholars working today, my friend and colleague Jarvis Givens from Compton, California, and my dear brother, mentor, and friend Cornell West. Uh, I should say it's especially wonderful for, for me and Cornell to be here to discuss the art of Black teaching. Uh, Brother West's late mother, Irene B. West, was a legendary educator in Sacramento and in Northern California and actually has a school named after her out there um, in her honor. And my mother taught 40 years in Baltimore City Public Schools and was the 1977 Baltimore City Teacher of the Year. But Independently of that, we're here to celebrate Jarvis's path-breaking new book, Fugitive Pedagogy, Carter G. Woodson and the Art of Black Teaching, a book that I find truly, truly impressive. It's prodigiously researched, it's powerfully written, and it's one of a handful of field-defining books in African-American studies. It really offers a whole new way of thinking about the history and practice of black education. It's an incisive intervention into recent debates about anti-racist education. Uh, it gives us a new way of thinking about the past and possible future of black studies. And importantly, it brings right back to the center of our field an unjustly neglected figure, uh, the legendary Carter G. Woodson. Uh, I learned a ton from this book, and I hope we'll talk about all of these things today um, in, in dialogue with, with Jarvis. So let me um, first ask you uh, in a kind of expansive way, what inspired you to take on this project? How, how did you come to the idea of writing about Carter G. Woodson and this legion of Black teachers he inspired? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, I have to say uh, thank you, Professor Terry, for that wonderful and thoughtful introduction um, and for being here with us today to facilitate this conversation. Um, but uh, in thinking about the question that you just asked in terms of what inspired me to write this book, um, there's actually a number of things that come to mind and you know some of it is personal, some of it is academic. Um, and I, so I think I'll start with the, the, the latter first in terms of the kind of first thing that really triggered something in my mind about um, that set me on this path. And that was coming across a footnoted reference to Carter G. Woodson's textbook um, in my first year of graduate school. I didn't go to graduate school to study the history of black education, but I remember coming across a reference to The Negro in Our History, which was Carter G. Woodson's first textbook that he published in 1922. And immediately in my mind, it just raised a number of questions. I had never thought about the idea that black teachers had published textbooks um, during the period of Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and it was also in, important for me to learn that Carter G. Woodson was more than just, uh, you know, he publishes The Miseducation of the Negro in 1933, which was a really, is a really important text, but I didn't know very much about his longer history as a public school teacher. Um, and so that just kind of uh, led me on a path to look into, look more into this. And then I came across book reviews written in the Crisis Magazine by people like Jesse Fawcett, who talked about how amazing this textbook was and how widely distributed it was among black teachers. I also came across a book review by Elaine Locke. I remember um, reading it and Elaine Locke referred to this textbook as, you know, he says, one of those books that brings about a revolution of the mind. Wow. Um, and I became really interested in studying more about uh, the intellectual traditions of black teachers because so the frame that I had been given to think about black education was one that just only talked about separate and unequal, that black schools and black education prior to Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, you know, the images of dilapidated school buildings are what immediately kind of came to mind and the aggressive neglect of these schools. But nothing about this kind of strong intellectual tradition among the educators and the very um, important kind of communal relationships at the heart of these schools. Very little about that had ever kind of made it into the public discourse that I had been exposed to about the history of black education. Um, and so that's what kind of set me on the path there. Um, and I should say, you know, I grew up attending schools where I had majority black teachers from preschool through the eighth grade. Um, and then I went to a high school that was predominantly black and had majority black teachers there as well. And so 
I had been exposed to, you know, import the importance of Black History Month, right? Uh, we we had to learn poems and, and read literature by African American authors. And it became interesting for me to think about, well, this is something that was connected to a much longer tradition. Um, and then I realized that many of my teachers were actually, you know, former students in Jim Crow schools in the South. And that really kind of set me on a path to really start peeling back the layers that ended up leading to the, the book that we are here to discuss today. It's remarkable. I mean, just to even bring that personal uh, background to it, because I think you'd probably be one of the only uh, Harvard professors for whom that's true, uh, to have predominantly black teachers um, all, all throughout your K through 12 experience. So to, to hear their voices in the text and to see some of the archival tricks you do uh, to bring to life um, what these people are doing in the classroom shows how you're able to draw on uh, not just your own historical training, but, but to channel some of your imaginative uh, powers from your own experience in, in, into the historical data. But let me ask you this. Um, so Carter G. Woodson's like really at the center of this project and in a remarkable way, right? We see him throughout the course of his life. He's founding the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. He's a powerful historian in his own right. He's a popularizer of ideas. He's a polemicist. I mean, if you read Miseducation of the Negro, uh, you can imagine people going crazy in the audience when he's giving these lectures. Uh, and he's also a philosopher of education, um, probably one of the greatest. And what do you wish people knew more about of Carter G. Woodson? So, you know, you have Black History Jeopardy. Maybe people know he founded Black History Month. But after coming away with your book, what do you want people to know about him? And what do you think about, what do you want them to know about his mind, his contributions to our thinking about the practice of education, particularly anti-racist education? Yeah, thanks. Uh, one of the first thing that comes to mind was the, the, the big thing that I had to do from the beginning was that I wanted to demonstrate that Carter G. Woodson was drawing on a tradition that he was exposed to well before he got to the elite universities we tend to associate him with, right? We, we think of him as the second African-American to receive a PhD in history from Harvard um, in 1912. And of course we know W.E.B. Du Bois was the first um, or that you know he, he obtained a bachelor's and a master's degree from the University of Chicago, but one of the things that I tried to do in this book is to really take a lot of time to think about Carter G. Woodson's experiences as the child and the student of formerly enslaved black people um, and someone who did not even begin high school until the age of 20 years old. Um, and, and I really wanted to sit with so much of the things that he was exposed to through his family narratives, um, through his time working in the coal mines with Civil War veterans and the ways that this, the story of these men shaped his own orientation to thinking about um, Black people as carriers of culture and as repositories of knowledge. And, you know, the fact that his, um, you know, hearing stories about, you know, from his own mother about being on the auction block and seeing the, the bronze statue of George Washington in, in Richmond, Virginia, right, as um, her family is being sold and kind of ripped apart, right, in the way that these enslaved people remembered that statue as bound up in that particular experience and him being a child being exposed to these stories, I, I wanted to sit and pick those, sit with those things to think about what that must have meant for him in terms of his own development as a thinker, as a learner, well before we see him at, at, at the university level. Um, and before he becomes, you know, uh, in 1915, someone who founds this a, this important association um, that would then go on to found Black History Month, I, I wanted to talk about his own lived experiences and what it meant for him to be in a one room school being taught by two, his two formerly enslaved uncles. Um, and I shared an image of Carter G. Woodson uh, from the Frederick Douglass uh, High School that I wanted, thank you for pulling that up. This is the, one of the earliest photos that we have of Carter G. Woodson. If you look in the very back of the photo, Carter G. Woodson is the, the young man um, to, the, to the far right at the top, on the top row. And this is at um, around 1896, when he's attending the Frederick Douglass High School in Huntington, West Virginia, 
where he's um, being also taught and educated by another, you know, relative of his named Carter Barnett, right? And even at this school, and his he, he would leave and graduate, but his cousin Carter Barnett would be fired as the principal of this school because of the fact that he was running running an independently um, published newspaper and trying to organize black people locally. So Carter G. Woodson was exposed to this legacy of black teachers as more than just teaching in the con in the four walls of a schoolroom, but that they were always engaged in the kind of politics and organizing on the ground in the communities in which they were serving. Um, and it, it became important to me to, to talk about that, right? Um, to understand who he was and the kind of the traditions that shaped him before he got to a place like Harvard um, in 1908, right? It, it makes me remember the you quote one of the, the lines um, where he says, uh, it took him 20 years to <laughs> recover from the education he received at Harvard uh, because what he's coming in with is so profound and so powerful. Uh, and it's a real lesson for, I think, a lot of us who are thinking through these crises around affirmative action. What is the future of it going to be? Crises around admissions and, and selective schooling to, to think critically about how we come to understand merit, how we come to understand the kinds of knowledge people can contribute to a place of higher learning. Um, and, and you just do it painstakingly well in the book. Um, no rhetoric. It's, it's painstakingly demonstrated. Um, I should say, just in case you're just now tuning in, we are here with Jarvis Givens uh, discussing his brand new book, Fugitive Pedagogy, Carter G. Woodson and the Art of Black Teaching. We have a special discount link available for you all to buy directly from the press. Brother Givens is too shy to say this, but his book has already sold out the first printing. We're on the second printing now. Uh, if you go to Amazon, uh, it, it may be sold out right now. So buy it directly from Harvard University Press. Uh, don't punish him because he's successful. If you can't get it from Harvard University Press, go on Amazon and just wait for it to get back in stock. Get the get the pre-order so that it comes uh, right when it's when it's back. Uh, so please don't punish this brother for, for having a lot of people who want to read this fantastic book. I want to bring in Cornell here, Brother Wes. Um, you are one of the great democratic intellectuals of our time or any time, a great philosopher. And one of the things that you study really intensely is the philosophy of education as a, as a way of the conduct of life, as thinking about figures like John Dewey, uh, Schiller, Rousseau, Du Bois. Um, where is Carter G. Woodson in this conversation? What can he teach us about the education of the oppressed, about a, a anti-racist education that might meet the demands of beating back the white supremacist propaganda it has to swim upstream against? Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate that, that question. I appreciate you mentioned mama. Salute your precious mother. Of course, we all acknowledge the legendary uh, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham as a distinguished scholar that she is. But the answer to, to your question is found in this text, though, brother. A critical, crucial, indispensable work of high quality scholarship giving us a way of creatively responding to the vicious legacies of white supremacy. And we know in a white supremacist world, black love is a crime and black history is a curse and black freedom is a pipe dream and black hope is a joke. And what Brother Jarvis has been able to do straight out of Compton, straight out of Berkeley, now at Harvard, Harvard blessed to have all three of you all in a wonderful way, is to lay bare the ways in which a black tradition in place provided a way of seeing. And I, the question I want to ask my dear brother Jarvis is, uh, I, was, I wanted to hear him talk more about what I recall on page 100, his notion of rigorous sight, rigorous sight. It reminds me actually of a letter that the great Henry James wrote to Robert Louis Stevenson, January 12th, 1901. He said, no theory is kind to us that cheats us of seeing. No theory is kind to us that cheats us of seeing. The frameworks in place, both in Carter Woodson's day and in some ways still in our own day, cheat too many people of seeing things. Mm -hmm. And the stress that you have on a language that allows us to see the future, building on Toni Morrison, 
the ways in which the blind spots can be called into question. Seeing black humanity, seeing black creativity, seeing black genius, seeing the ways in which black folk as human beings, faults and foibles, but also mm -hmm. tremendous capacity and potentiality. So could you say a bit more on this notion of rigorous sight that I think is so rich, my brother? Right. Uh Thank you for lifting that up, uh, Brother Wes. What I really had to sit with the way Carter G. Woodson constantly came back to the way the American curriculum became an impediment for Black people to actually see the realities of their material conditions and how the world was structured in a particular was structured on their um, subjugation uh, in very. Uh, uh, deep and kind of embedded ways, right? And he talked, there's one line that I, I always stood out to me is he says, you know, black students will go through this education system and they'll attain all the kind of the highest forms of knowledge that there is, but these education, uh, these educational degrees, et cetera, et cetera, what teaches him to become blind to the Negro, right? To become blind to his own condition. And he talks about, um, he always talks about this idea of estrangement that happens the further one gets um, in terms of moving away from the community and the experience that they're coming from, because they're be what it means for black people to become initiated into a system of knowledge that is built on so many distortions of black life and black culture, right? Is that it, it becomes an impediment to, for one's own ability to actually see clearly both the beauty in black life and the, the beauty in what black people had created to, um, to sustain them themselves into kind of and to live and to persist, right? But also it, um, you know, it, mis it mystified the way in which white supremacy functioned both structurally, but then also in the kind of social arrangement of the world in which they were living. And so what Woodson was saying is that it's not, we're not only, it's not only important to teach black history just for the purposes of saying, listing all of the Negro first, right? The first black person to do this, the first black person to do that, but it's, to give black students resources to, um, to, to hold up against the kind of myths that they're surrounded by and to, to interpret those things and to kind of critique the, the world in which they found themselves in. And this idea of rigorous sight that is, is really me trying to name something that I see um, embedded in Woodson's criticism in the miseducation of the Negro because he's constantly using the language of seeing and, and blind to the, the Negro and his condition, right? Um, and, and all of these things is to, to talk about what he's trying to cultivate. He's trying to cultivate this kind of um, a, 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 a well-studied perspective on Black people's experience in their culture, but also a, a, pers a, a sharpened and a mature perspective on their oppression, right? And how mm -hmm. these things are sustained. And that that's an essential component of any liberatory educational model that black people that you know that in terms of what black people needed, this is what he's offering and putting forward, and saying that teachers have to be explicit about that um, and have a political clarity about that as a part of their work. Mm -hmm. I mean, could I just jump in, brother, brother no, Brandon, right quick? Of course, yeah. Because one of the things I loved about the text is the way in which you're trying to get us to see more deeply and clearly, but also to feel more profoundly. You spend a lot of time talking about feeling in that way because you remember you think of page 44 and it's classic the miseducation of the negro where, where carter g woodson says i want the highly educated negro to fall in love with their own people mm -hmm. so that loving folk allows you to see certain things that folk who don't love the folk can't see right and right. you bring that together in a powerful way and of course the third moment is act courageously once you see clearly feel deeply then you're ready to throw down. You're ready to act. You're ready to yeah. sacrifice. You're ready to yeah. take a risk. You see? So that, that that coming together in this text is a powerful thing that the audience needs to know. And you and you um it reminds me of that famous, it's probably the most famous quote in the book from Miseducation, where he says, you know, if you can control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his action. Right. When you determine what a man shall think, you don't have to concern yourself with what he will do. You make a man feel that he's inferior. You do not have to compel him to accept an inferior status, for he will seek it himself. So it's 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 related in a deep way to the courage question: um, what people are willing to do, what they're willing to risk, 
is going to be tied up in the possibilities they imagine for themselves, the capabilities they think that people like them are, are, are prone to having. And so the, the black education question really puts that at the center. Um, and you can see why it would elicit such severe repression from the authorities, such suspicion, surveillance, uh, outright violence and assassination. And so what, what I was hoping you could do, Jarvis, is, is maybe say a little bit about what is this idea of fugitive pedagogy, right? Because those aren't going to be words that are familiar to a lot of people. And like, why describe a teacher as a fugitive? Um, yeah, I think the best way of getting at this question, I think, is to I guess, really tell the story that uh, led to me using the language of fugitive pedagogy. Um, and this is after I had already written my dissertation. This, the language of fugitivity was not a part of the dissertation project. This really became a, a way, a new way of seeing um, and thinking about the research that I had done when I was completing my PhD. But I had come across this story um, by Jerry Moore, uh, who was talking, Jerry Moore, is, it was a, uh, a retired minister in Washington, D.C., and he's talking about his high school teacher in Webster Parish, Louisiana. And, 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 I, and I should say that these are, uh, this is from a, a video footage that was shared with me by a member of Asala who had a number of, of, of uh, videotapes from old Asala events and things that she felt would be useful for the research that I was doing. So she shared this with me. And I'm watching this video in the a storage room at her church in Prince George County, Maryland. And this, the story that Jerry Moore tells about his teacher secretly reading from Carter G. Woodson's textbook that she kept in her lap underneath the desk. Um, and that the required outline that teachers were expected to teach from, she kept it openly displayed on the desk. And Jerry Moore says, when someone came into the classroom, she would stop reading from Woodson's book on the Negro. And she began reading from the outline and then when the person disappeared, her eyes went back to the book in her lap. And that one kind of scenario for me just turned, you know, completely reoriented my approach to trying to tell the story in, in, in the book is because it's not just about the content of the text, but it also has to do with the method of transmission of these ideas and really in the of transmitting this tradition, right? Um, that completely undermines the very Jim Crow school structures that black teachers and black students are gathered in. Um, and so once I started to see that, and then I just started to kind of look and try to, to, to make sense of these things. Um, but then I went back to Carter G. Woodson's textbook. And then I looked at the passage when he's talking about, um, you know, how, the, how enslaved people learned to read and write. And he says, and I'll quote from uh, the textbook, he says, how some of these slaves learned in spite of opposition makes a beautiful story. Knowing the value of learning as a means of escape and having longing for it too because it was forbidden, many slaves continued their education under adverse circumstances. So I became interested in trying to tell the story of this political orientation to black education that developed in the time of slavery, right? By those enslaved people who acquired literacy and meaningful education by theft. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, and there was, black education had always been closely associated with black rebellion, um, with black enslaved people being, you know, discontent, right? If we're to think about the passage from Frederick Douglass's autobiography, when he uh, recounts his uh, master, Hugh Auld saying, you know, scolding his wife saying, how are you teaching this young black boy to read? Because if he learns to read and write, this, this being accomplished, he'll be quote, running away with himself. Right. Um, I just started to see these narratives about the relationship between black people resisting and pursuing escape in the time of slavery um, as foundational to this counter educational tradition. And of course, after emancipation, there continued to be violent oversight when it comes to black education, even as it's legally permitted. Um, black schools are regularly being burned down after the Civil War. And the meaningful parts of black education, right? The political um, heart of black education continue to have to be concealed by black teachers and students. And so we know that critical parts of black education continue to be kept hidden and concealed in a particular kind of way. And I wanted to draw a narrative line between those subversive practices of education in the period of enslavement, and then 
you know, to, to the work and efforts of teachers like um, Tessie McGee. Um, and and I, have, I have to tell you, when I first started using this language of uh, fugitive pedagogy, um, I remember a conversation I had with Professor Higginbotham, with Evelyn Higginbotham. She said, you know, she said, you know, why, why are you using this language of fugitivity? She's like, you know, it, um, and at this point I hadn't, I had just been using it and borrowing from contemporary uses of it in, in the field of black studies from the contemporary moment, but not really being as accountable to the archive as I, as I hope to have accomplished in the book. But she says, you know, it sounds nice, but where's the substance, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? She's like, you know, it sounds nice, but, but, and so that's when I started to really mine the archive, right? And to think deeply about what it meant that the first black author textbooks were actually written by fugitive slaves, right? That, you know, this tradition that people like Woodson and Tessie McGee inherited is actually coming from a counter educational tradition that's bound up with, um, you know, those enslaved people who absconded from plantations, right? But also to think about, um, you know, the ways in which Black teachers themselves are holding up these narratives of fugitive slaves, naming schools after fugitive Absolutely. slaves, like that, right? Absolutely. Um, let me ask you briefly on a, on a, on a quick follow-up here, um, because Evelyn raises a really good point about the language of fugitivity. And it's very old current in Black studies, like a lot of people are using it. But what, what's striking about your use of it, to me, is that your conception of it seems much more tightly tied to institution building, right? That when usually people talk about fugitivity, especially in the education space, they're, they're only talking about anarchic practices, covert practices, often individual or very small, tight-knit tight bands, um, where the telos of the action, what it aims at, is not really a, a new institution, a new... Um, governing logic for the broader society. It's just meant to escape, uh, escape surveillance, escape control. But your your picture of it is different. I just thought you might briefly say a little bit about um, your sense of the, the relationship between fugitivity and institution building in Woodson. Right. Well, you know, and for me, it's hard to kind of make that argument and still be accountable to Black folks in the historical record because one of the first things that black people are doing after emancipation is they're building schools. They're, they're working to build institute, they're casting an institutional vision that has their freedom in mind, right? And that where they're thinking about trying to establish community institutions that offer the resources that they understand themselves to need in order to make freedom a, a real thing, right? And so the kind of anti-institutional perspective around fugitivity doesn't really make sense when we actually see in the historical record people who are actually, you know, fugitive slaves working to help build and to create these sorts of institutions. So for me, in order to be accountable to that history, there's there's not really any way for me um, to kind of disregard or completely look past these this institutional vision that um, uh, Black folks are having in the first days of freedom, and even during the period of of slavery as well, right? We know that Black people are building, trying to build institutions not only in terms of religious institutions, um, but also, right, they're working to, whether it be clandestine schools that they're working to establish during the period of slavery, um, that then inform the institutional visions that they have and what comes after. And for someone like Carter G. Woodson and the educators that he's working with, these are folks that are a part of that, um, that, that are emerging and coming from that tradition, right? And they're, they're, working, they're, they're more interested in transmitting a set of ideas and this, the kind of moral imperative of their work and not necessarily just invested in, you know, fugitivity, uh, you know, for fugitivity's sake, right? And subversion right. just for the sake of, of subverting things, right? It's about transmitting a set of traditions, a body of knowledge that they understand to be important resources for the building of leaders and for the building of um, a race of people to kind of to do battle with the, the challenges that, that they're going to that they're confronting in the world around them. Right, right, right. And th th there is a sense in which there's a conception of futivity that is tied to negativity hmm. and it's a parasite on a host. Whereas your notion of futivity is tied to futurity. 
Mm. There's a future that is emerging. I mean, I think the audience needs to know of your fascinating and rich connection of Woodson to the great Amy Césaire from Martinique, and Sylvia Winters, towering figure still alive, right. Jamaica. Of course, you know, head of African studies at Stanford for many years, inherited from from Sinclair Drake, but then also the great Kenyan writer. In Googie, so you, you're talking about decolonial reality mm -hmm. reflected in part with Carter G. Woodson's four years in the Philippines as a teacher, dealing with the American Empire in the 19, 1903, what is it about 193, 1907, I think it is, my brother. Right, right. Or something like that. But I must say this though, my, what, my, one of my favorite moments, though, man, is when you quote Sister Lila Amos Pendleton, her narrative of the Negro 1912. And I just want to read this with folk, because this is kenosis. You see, this is at the center of the best of black folk, the best of humanity, giving everything, emptying, donating oneself. And, and she says, and you had a quote, that those of us who feel that we have given the very best and done the very most is possible for us to give and do, we hope you will not fail us. Mm. And this text is an example of not failing the old folk, brother. <laughs> Building on the best of the tradition of a great people who, in the face of unbelievable hatred and terror and trauma, keep dishing out these truth tellers and mm -hmm. these love warriors and these freedom fighters. And Carter G. Woodson's one of the greatest who right. was produced out of the slave condition that you talk about. The tide of Brother Oliver Jones. I love Brother Oliver in there. <laughs> maybe, you, maybe you can say a little word about Oliver, man. I love that brother. Uh, Oliver Jones, who's essentially paying Woodson to come to uh, the, the parlor at his house to, to read to this group of illiterate, um, you know, s s you know, technically illiterate, right, uh, Civil War veterans who's working with him in the coal mines. But, you know, Woodson is a young boy at the time who's literate. And so they ask for him to come after, after long days of work to read um, from Black newspapers and to read from uh, Black publications. And they're speaking back to these texts based on their own lived experiences. And this is why, you know, for me, it was really important to take a lot of time with those early scenes because there's no way for us to really understand the kind of courage that Woodson had to speak back to Harvard professors who told him, who laughed in his face and right. said that there's, there's no such thing as Negro history, right? right. Um, and to right. go out to actually build an organization to try to completely rewrite the epistemological order, which is really what he's setting out to do is to say we have to work to uproot these distortions about black life that are embedded in our, the system of representation that shapes everything about this world that we live in, right? Um, but I, I wanna say one more thing if I can, Brandon, to uh, something that Cornell mentioned about this tradition and about Lila Amos Pendleton literally speaking to the students that she imagines to be her audience in reading these texts, right? And Carter G. Woodson does something very similar um, in his textbooks as well. But one of the things that I became really, really interested in showing is the relationship between um, the, the kind of social emotional context of the, of, and the work that these teachers were doing and the, the, the leadership and the leaders and the thinkers that we see emerge that are leaving, leading the civil rights movement, even the black power era and demanding black studies at, you know, in the American university is that we have to understand that these people didn't just fall out of the sky, right? right. <laughs> they, they, didn't just, they didn't just kind of make this, you know, they didn't just grow out of nowhere, right? There's a very long sustained um, tradition among black teachers that were intentional about cultivating and, and planting the seeds of these ideas in the minds of their students, um, you know, so, so that they would have the courage to do things. Someone like, a, you know, we think about John Lewis, I know, um, uh, Professor Higginbotham mentioned John Lewis earlier in her introductory comments, but there are so many people that we can think about. You mentioned uh, St. Clair Drake uh, and, you know, es establishing the Black Studies program at Stanford. I was just reading last night about him reflecting on his teachers in Virginia and how they would go to these Black teacher summer schools and come back to his school in Virginia and teach the students about um, Black history. And then he goes on to be the leader of the, the Asala chapter at Hampton University when he gets there in the 1920s. But this is not, that's not a tradition that he gets when he's at in college. It's a tradition that's transmitted and that's passed on by black school teachers. Absolutely. But that same Drake has the leader student strike because the white professors 
and the white elites there don't want black self-respect, black self-determination, the kind of thing that you point out, Brother Franklin, the great Vincent Franklin talks about, mm -hmm. but also the fact that the great Woodson only spends that one year at Howard because of his controversy with the white brother Durkee. Right, right, right. And you would think that he was he's fundamentally associated with the great institution of Howard University. Could you say a little word about that, though, brother? Yeah, that while while um, Professor Givens answers, remember we're going to take questions. So you guys submit your questions. We'll answer them. Uh, so, so put them in the box, and and we'll get to them. Right. That that was a very important point because you know a lot of people assume that Carter G. Woodson, as an educator, was someone who you know was primarily would have primarily been associated with institutions of higher education. But for his you know nearly thirty years as an educator. Only two of those years were spent at a historically black college or at a, an institution of higher education. He was primarily a K through 12 teacher, right? And we even see the resistance from the academic uh, you know, Senate at Howard University in the years preceding Woodson's arrival in 1919, where you have the black school teachers at Dunbar at, um, at the M Street School in Washington, DC. They're, um, they have the boys coming in leading uh, workshops on sketches of Negro history and outlines for Negro history. Woodson is leading workshops for the teachers on trying to revamp how they're thinking about civics um, and, and English uh, literature education, right? Um, and the same, literally within a month's time, uh, there's a, a proposal for a course that's put forward at Howard University by Kelly Miller and a couple of other professors that's rejected, right? A course on racial, uh, on, on, uh, social issues and the Negro, right? It's rejected by the academic senate, and you know, and Woodson goes to Howard, and he's he has these challenges with um, the white leadership of the university, and this is kind of resonant with so many of the aspects of Woodson's experience with white philanthropists and with white education reformers um, that he would actually write about in the Miseducation of the Negro. Is that you have these, uh, you know a number of white education reformers and philanthropists that are manipulating the development of black education and picking and choosing which black intellectuals um, are worthy of support or get to be elevated to positions of authority and influence, even in black institutions. And Woodson is very critical of that. And, and I just wanna remind us, I opened up by talking about his cousin, Carter Barnett, who's fired from his high school for doing something very similar. Right. So when Woodson recognizes this during his time at Howard, he decides that he'll bow out and leave as opposed to publicly apologizing to the white president of the university, because that's what was being demanded of him in order for him to stay. I, I was hoping, um, Brother Wes, if, if you might be able to speak to this part of um, Carter G. Woodson's life, this idea of having such a profound sense of vocation and integrity that on the one hand, it leads him to have to take stands to leave institutions that he's at, to um, you know, give up on projects that he wanted to pursue. And on the other hand, that kind of commits him to a vision where the institutions for the study of black life and culture have to be autonomous in some way that they have to have a kind of independence that's not just intellectual, but that's material. Mm, mm. No, when Brother Jarvis refers to how the, uh, the white power structure created this big project to engage in encyclopedic investigation of black life and who do they exclude? W.B. Du Bois and Carter G. Woodson. Yep. These are the two most towering figures in terms of high quality scholarly reflection about black life past, present, and future. And Du Bois, you know, after a while decides, okay, they're going to spend the money, so maybe I should. And there's a wonderful exchange in this text with the letters. And I, I don't know whether we can go into that now, but that wonderful exchange between Woodson and, and Du Bois in this regard. But it's just a matter of being uh, so tied to one's calling that there's a level of intellectual integrity, there's a level of personal commitment, and just a deep caring for black people, which has nothing to do with hating anybody else. Right. Woodson would embrace white scholars. He writes positively, Herskovitz and others, 
so he was a Jewish brother. He's, he's very embracing in his own, but he's concerned with truth. He's concerned with beauty. He's concerned with goodness in that way. But I do think, and I don't know what you think about it, Jarvis, but I think that his calling was so intense that he never got a chance to live his own personal and social life, man. I mean, most of us want to be steal away on Friday night and do our thing. You know what I mean? Hey, Carter, good one. Yeah, right. Yeah. This, this is this is true, and you know, and I think about this. Um, there's there was a one moment when I read a letter that he, when he's writing to the Rosenwald Foundation when he's trying to get funding for this encyclopedia that he wanted to write because he felt like he had accumulated so much of this knowledge and he felt, you know, he wanted to get it out and preserve it before he died, right? Um, right. And, and I think, again, I think that there is something very important about the fact that Woodson starts high school at the age of 20. He, does, he founds the association in 1915 at the age of 40 years old. So by the time things are really um, going, mm thinking about the scale of what it was that he understood himself to be doing, you know, he really did make a decision that he was devoting his life to this particular cause, right? The office of the association, that's where he worked, lived, and died um, in, the, in the off, that office at, in the Shaw District of Washington, D.C., and was kind of really working around the clock, right? Um, and And I, I'm referring to this letter to uh, the Rosenwald Foundation when he's trying to get funding for this uh, multi-volume encyclopedia that this is part of the falling out that him and Du Bois would have in the 1930s. Um, but the the spirit that comes across in their letter is that he's there's a lot that he feels like he needs to get done and there's very little time to, you know, to, to take off um, given the, the scale of the project and the mission so to speak, right? Um, but I, I, I share your sentiment that sometimes you can look at this and say, you know, you have to kind of, yeah, there's that. Yeah. We, we yeah. know our dear brother Brandon just had his second child. Well, he, he didn't have a child, he had it. But, <laughs> but, but he got two magnificent, precious little ones. And we, therefore he's gonna be able to live a fuller life intellectually, socially, and so forth and so on. And somebody like Woodson, you figure, he didn't really have that kind of balance, I don't think. Am I misreading, you think? No, no, that's correct. And this is why in Du Bois, is in, in the obituary that Du Bois wrote for Woodson, he said, I don't even think he had a hobby. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> but in a way, I mean, it's a, it's a profound sacrifice because in a way, mm -hmm. he makes it easier for us to have children, right? Because when we know we're sending them into schools equipped with uh, better tools than they would have otherwise, not to be taught to despise themselves. And it um, it leads me to, to, to one of the questions we have um, uh, from Lynn Kelly Chu Sramek. Uh, apologies if I've, I've mispronounced it, um, but, but she's talking about how there's been a lot of controversy in her state regarding legislation that's been passed banning race and gender and education with regards to history. So the attack on so-called critical race theory, the attack on ethnic studies, the attack on African-American history. And uh, she and another uh, questioner are, are wondering, what does your book, Jarvis, have to teach us about the, the potential response to this new attack? on the teaching of African-American history, on the centering of race and the study of, of this civilization. Um, you use the language of fugitivity because there's always an attempt at recapture. And here we are. Uh, all the things that Carter G. Woodson tried to teach are being pushed out of the schools once again. How do we respond? Uh, and another question asks us, you know, how do you practice fugitivity now? Um, given given these laws and this this assault, this viciousness. And Cornell, I'd love to hear you on this too. Well, one of the first things that I would say is that it's really important for us to realize that the inclusion of like multicultural uh, perspectives in schools and in curriculum is actually a fairly new phenomenon um, or, you know, the, the kind of diversity and inclusion language in the larger span of time, right? This is something that's just very new within the last Couple, you know, a few decades, and prior to that, you know, there had always consistently, been, and even still, this even in the recent past, it was very unevenly distributed in terms of where we saw access in, in the, you know, in more equitable treatment to black and um, experiences or the experiences of other um, 
racialized minority groups in schools. And so that's something that's very important to think about. Um, and I, I think that one of the models that I think is important from these educators is that they were always intentional to build institutions that supported their mission for a, a kind of a, a educational vision for the students that they were serving and to protect themselves, is that it wasn't individual teachers operating um, in isolation, right? So Tessie McGee, this teacher that I talked about, was at a school where the principal and the teachers were involved in the Louisiana Colored Teachers Association, right? So one of the things that I was really intentional to talk about in the book are these organizations that black teachers mm -hmm. created to protect themselves and to protect their interests and to advocate for their interests and the best interests of their students. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from these institutions that black teachers created um, in the past that, you know, that by and large don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Professor West. Yes, I would want to argue that what you actually get in this text is the ways in which Jarvis, Gibbons, and Carter G. Woodson are in quest for truth. And the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. So when people are blind to the Negro, which means you can't tell any story about America without Black people's role, both enslaved as well as creative scientists, artists, musicians, pharmacists, lawyers, politicians. You can't tell a story of America without the Civil War. If you tell the story of the Civil War and don't say nothing about 200,000 black soldiers joining the Union Army, you're not interested in truth. So we just have to tell our fellow citizens, we thought you were interested in truth. Oh, you're not interested in truth at all. You don't want to talk about race. You don't want to talk about gender. You think you can tell a story of America without talking about women? You're not interested in truth in that way. Is that fair, Brother Jarvis, in terms of? Absolutely. 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 Now, I mean, how you practice fugitivity today, I think, you know, like a good jazz musician, that there's a variety of different forms. It's not one thing. We were talking in the earlier discussion a couple of weeks ago in that wonderful colloquium that Brother, Brother Brandon ran with, uh, with Kirsten about how, you know, the great uh, uh, Hartman, uh, Sadea Hartman's conception of fugitivity. She's concerned about the truth of certain women who are highly suspicious of some of the teachers mm -hmm. that, that Brother Jarvis is talking about. You mm -hmm. know, these are women who are on the block, on the corner, in the jazz clubs, in the kitchenettes and so forth. So you got class, dis uh, you got class divisions here, but that doesn't mean that these black school teachers are not playing fundamental roles. Right. It just means that they they will also become authorities that other people will be critical of and respond against. Again, we go back to, to Evelyn Higginbotham's powerful formulation of, of respectability. And it was never respectability in terms of looking down on people. It was black right. respect, black right. people respecting themselves, but it could shade into a respectability. And Evelyn was always critical of that, even though people tend to overlook that. Is that fair, Brother Jarvis? Absolutely. No, and I think that's similar to the story of these, that what, what you just said, uh, Brother West, is absolutely a part of the story of these teachers and why this book is trying to reframe how we think about the history of Black teachers, because many have just written them off as um, through this misinterpreted lens of what respectability politics or the, po the way that they interpret the politics of respectability, when in fact, politics of these educators were much, it was much more malleable. Um, on the ground when we look at the work that they were doing in communities um, and, and what they were striving for. Maybe well, this is my mother who was a school teacher, her mother went to second grade, father went to third grade, gut bucket sincerity tied to everyday life and everyday people's dignity, but she also AKA, so, oh, she's sophisticated now. She got that <laughs> context on the one hand, she got shallow Baptist church on the other hand, and she got vacation Bible school of all the brothers and sisters from the hood every summer. Every summer, six weeks. I mean, that's a little different than going to Martha's Vineyard. You know what I mean? This was a six-week commitment to everyday poor black folk who loving her, she's loving him. I ain't got nothing against Martha's Vineyard. I'm just making a joke. But the point is, is that you can imagine if you do, if you reduce Irene B. West just to respectability in the negative sense, rather right. than teaching a respect for herself and loving these everyday folk, loving her children like she loved us. Clifton and, 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 and Cynthia Shell and Cornell, then you're missing something. Same would be true for uh, uh, 
for, for, for Brother Brandon's magnificent mother. Is it is that true? That's absolutely right. And I can't think of a better note to end on than in honor of your dear mother, uh, Irene B. West, a celebration of the richness, the complex ethical issues that Brother Jarvis Givens brings in uh, fugitive pedagogy, the way he offers us a conception of rigorous sight, right? Channeling yeah. Carter G. Woodson so that part of what critical race theory is about is seeking truth, but knowing that the truth isn't always laid bare for us, gotcha. that it sometimes requires some unmasking of the propaganda that we inherit. So um, I have to turn it back over to Heather, but I hope you all uh, bring the, you know, get a copy of the book, as soon as you can, check the site for the link. Uh, celebrate Brother Givens and his extraordinary achievement. Thank you, Professor West. Thank you all for having me. I'll turn it back over to Heather from PBS Books. Thank you, Brandon. So we are at the top of the hour. We need to close the conversation. I'd like to thank Jarvis for your inspirational book and for your tremendous research about Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And thank you, Dr. West for sharing your words of wisdom and spending an hour with us. And then lastly, I'd like to thank Brandon for guiding this incredible conversation. So from PBS Books, we'd like to thank all of you for joining us. And until next time, thank you.